Welcome to Qingdao, home to 9 million people and one of China's booming second tier cities. I'm Tim Harcourt, the airport economist, and I'm taking you out of Shanghai and Shenzhen to discover another side of the Chinese economic miracle. Second tier cities are the new heartland of Chinese manufacturing and consumer growth. Rapid urbanisation and an emerging middle class are creating opportunities for businesses of all shapes and sizes. Coming up, we speak to exporters about how to approach second tier cities, discover how technology is transforming the economy and driving e-commerce, and hear how South Australia has developed a unique relationship with one Chinese province that's paying dividends for business. But first, let's learn more about what makes a second tier city and where you can find them. China is located in the middle of Asia. It's the most populous country in the world with 1.3 billion people. It has four first-tier cities, each with over 15 million people. Political capital Beijing, commercial centre Shanghai and manufacturing powerhouses Shenzhen and Guangzhou in the Pearl River Delta. Only 9% of the country's population actually live in the Big Four. China has 60 second-tier cities, just like Qingdao, and they're becoming increasingly important. Each has a population of 3 to 15 million people and $2,000 in GDP per capita. These second tier cities are developing Chinese industry and emerging as key consumer markets. Chongqing has a massive car industry and sells laptops and LCD screens. Xi'an is important for aviation. Chengdu manufactures for half the world's Fortune 500 companies. I'm here in Qingdao on the coast of Shandong province. It's a major industrial port, home to the Xingtao Brewery right behind me, Heia White Goods, Hisense Electronics and even Epiphone, a massive guitar factory. Shandong is also the birthplace of Confucius. Australian natural healthcare company Blackmores entered the Chinese market five years ago. Since then it's grown the business online and expanded its offline offerings in first tier cities. The company is now pushing into second and third tier markets, including here in Qingdao. Let's find out how they're going. We have about three and a half thousand points of physical distribution offline in China now, with a focus on, on really 20 major uh, cities and provinces uh, in the country. Is it very different to approach a second tier city compared to the big four? Yeah, look, I think it is, Tim. I mean, obviously, the, the sophistication of the stores is quite similar. So if you look at this store here, it's a sophisticated store in a second-tier city. But I think for, for consumers in the second and first-tier cities are different. Their understanding of the category, understanding of vitamins, understanding of the health and well-being needs is quite different. So there's a lot more education of the consumer and the store owners and the retailers in second-tier cities than what it would be, say, in a Shanghai or a Beijing. In second-tier cities, are foreign brands well accepted? Look, I think they are, Tim. People like imported products, and I think they, they have, a, have an aspiration to buy imported products. I think one of the challenges is that a lot of consumers in second and third tier cities, they really don't know one foreign brand from another. What's quality, what's not quality. So again, a part of our, our job as a brand is to help people understand our products, understand the quality, and understand the benefits they can receive from taking those products. Is marketing very different? I think for second and third tier cities we do a lot more local activation. So we'll do a lot of activity, for example, in store with our store advisors and we do local, act local activity. We also do a lot of training where we try to tailor that training for what might be the certain products set in a certain market. The cities are very different in China, the second tier cities. So what goes down in Qingdao is very different than Chengdu. If you look across China, there's sort of really maybe 20 major economic clusters. And so there is an economic cluster, if you like, around Qingdao, around Jinan, around Wulamuchi in Xinjiang. And we look at what's the demographic of those consumers there, and we try to tailor both the marketing strategy and the product set around those consumers. So, for example, honestly, if you're in Qingdao, you're on the ocean, you're probably eating a fair bit of fish. OK, so, so maybe fish oil is not so popular here. But out in Xinjiang in western China, not a lot of fish out in Xinjiang. People generally need to have more omega-3 and omega-6, probably in Xinjiang than they do in Qingdao. So we'd, we'd try to market that around the specific health needs of that, of that group of people. Are there any unique challenges that you have in a second tier city that you may not have in a Beijing or a Shanghai? There are there's some challenges around distribution. There's some challenges also, I think, around, as I say, around awareness of the category and the products and what, what, it can, what it can do for you. And so there probably is a need for more education in the second and third tier cities. And sometimes I think you do face some challenges around our products need certain storage conditions, to say certain types of distribution conditions, which can sometimes be a bit more challenging, particularly if you say out in a province like 
uh, Xinjiang out in Western China is very hot in summer, very cold in winter, and some of the and the products need special storage. So some of those are challenges that we do face in expanding that distribution across a country the size of China. The explosion of China's second tier cities hasn't happened overnight. It's been a gradual knock-on effect from the policies put in place by former leader Deng Xiaoping four decades ago. China's economic transformation began in the Pearl River Delta, not far from Hong Kong. In 1980, Shenzhen became a special economic zone and joined forces with the energetic Cantonese in Guangzhou to develop a market economy. Next, zones around Shanghai and Beijing developed to form the first tier of urbanisation in modern China. In recent years, the Chinese government developed the One Belt, One Road model to further open up China and develop land, air and sea transport links with the rest of Asia and Europe. It's like a modern day version of the ancient Silk Road, which enabled China to dominate global trade for centuries. Manufacturers and rural migrants are now flocking to second tier cities and propelling growth, helping China produce 80% of the world's air conditioners, 70% of mobile phones and 60% of shoes. The Chinese government is pushing for digitisation across the country to increase efficiency and maintain growth. It's supporting startups and encouraging innovation through policies and incentives. As labour costs rise, businesses are also adopting technology to increase profitability. I checked in with Telstra's local joint venture to discover how technology is reshaping China's future. The Chinese government has been pushing very hard to promote the digitalization in order to respond to the slowing economy. One of the things that they're doing is to increase the efficiency uh, by using the industrial digitalization and also improve the, the uh, or increase the robustness of the IT infrastructure. Okay, and then the second trend that we all see, China is, um, is become more and more imaginative. Okay, the local enterprises or the local companies, they are now no longer just interested in copying the ideas or business model from the West. How is the government promoting digitization, particularly outside the first tier cities? Everybody knows that the second tier city will be the coming economic growth uh, engine in China. So Chinese government, they do a lot to promote the second tier cities in terms of the digitization. Okay, and then one of the things that they are going to support is that they, they give more incentive for the people and the company to set up the office there and then at the same time they build a lot of the railways and also the fast speed train and also the high speed roads okay to let the uh, to improve the transportation things and then to link the second tier city back to the first tier city. How is Telstra getting involved in the booming startup scene? We have a company or a program called Mirati of which, the, uh, of which the, there is a new initiative that we are motivating and supporting the enterprises when they want to expand their business into China or set up their operation in China, then this Meridi program will help them to, to do that. So what advice do you have for foreign companies entering China? First of all, choose the location wisely. You have to do a lot of the due diligence before you go into China and decide which city to go. The Chinese government has try a lot to, to build the uh, industrial cluster in different cities, okay? You can find different industrial cluster in some different cities. So you can, so when you do the study, you can find that in your own industry, okay? Which city you can find your supplier, you can find your uh, downstream uh, supplier, and also you can find your, where is your customer. So you can do that in the, in the um, uh, tier two city sometimes. So find the location wisely to do the due diligence. And then the second is to definitely, you have to look for a reliable partner in China. Building a long-term relationship with a reliable partner who have the local experience and also they have the global mindset that uh, they share the same vision is an utmost important for a business that they want to move into China. There are over 700 million mobile internet users in China. And on average, they spend almost two hours browsing the internet every day. China has overtaken the US as the world's largest online shopping market and 12% of all retail sales are now made on the internet. Braintree, a PayPal service, is helping businesses sell online throughout China by expanding access to both traditional payment methods and emerging payment technologies. China is a mobile first, almost mobile only uh, environment. So the trend is simple, it's, it's, it's everything has to be 
every transaction, every uh, interaction has to be around a mobile experience. It's very social and it's, uh, it's very shareable. It's a very different way of, of doing commerce. So if you have any script for doing well in e-commerce anywhere else in the world, just come along, throw it out the window and get ready to start again. And do Chinese culturally feel secure with online payments and ordering? This is probably one of the most forward uh, thinking or forward moving uh, countries for when it comes to digital payments. Um, I've never seen anything like it from the point of view of having singular wallets with the ability to make do online, offline, and probably that's where they've, they've forged ahead. There's really nothing that gets in the way or impedes uh, digital commerce in, in China. And how do you help merchants reach Chinese online shoppers? We see really customer engagement about multiple engagements with a customer, not one-off purchases. Really, if you, if you want to have someone as a customer, you need to uh, find a way that you can engage with them once, get their details, secure those details and just keep working with them and making that purchasing um, behaviour uh, seamless and, and easy to use. In markets like, uh, like China, mobile is, you know, for many people, the only computing device. So you need to make sure that even from a risk point of view or, or security point of view, that you've built a tool set that protects both the consumer and the merchant. And what tips do you have for converting online sales in the Chinese market? Don't try and repurpose your existing Western site. That's, that's not gonna work well for you. It needs to look and feel like the, the local sites. Um, for that, it would mean having to um, potentially reduce the image quality of some of your of your of your, your stock footage uh, it can be down to making sure that the size of the font you're using and even in uh, in simplified Chinese is is, is it the right um, size that it's easy to view but doesn't uh, isn't too big on the page again you don't want people scrolling too much um, they'd like to see a lot of information very quickly uh, you need to have the price next to the item you, you know it's really around going back to some basics of e-commerce the other aspect is understanding that the way you engage the customer isn't going to be the traditional way of the website getting to contact you via phone, getting to contact you via even a web inquiry form. They want to talk to you via WeChat. They're going to want to have a very quick and quick interaction with you and be able to talk to you and even make a payment via that, that method as well. So you need to have you know, that social connector as the, the main part of your customer interaction. After the break, we'll learn more about South Australia's 30-year relationship with Shandong Province and how it's paying off for business. Second-tier cities present exciting opportunities for foreign businesses, but can be daunting and harder to navigate than the big four. Contact your local government and national trade organisation, like Austrade, to find out how they can help you access the Chinese market. They may provide business education programs on cultural or legal issues, brief you on barriers to entry, connect you with mentors or provide business matching services. Shandong yeah. Province and the South Australian Government are an example of how deeper government ties make good business sense. Under their sister state relationship, they're proactively expanding trade and investment, promoting tourism, cultural and education exchanges and partnerships. Annual trade missions give businesses from both countries unprecedented access to local suppliers, introductions to possible partners and networking opportunities. As a result, new opportunities have emerged in food and wine, agribusiness, healthcare, education, tourism and research and development. Australian Medical Travel has participated in five trade missions to China in the past three years. This has helped them meet distributors and make deals happen. Let's catch up with Sonia Jovanovic on her latest South Australian Government trade mission to Shandong Province. With trade missions, you've been on a few now. Yes. How does it work? Is initially it just be a way of familiarising yourself with the market or does it lead to actual business outcomes? The first trip was just exploration. It was question and answer, some site visits, just understanding the scope. And so much of that first trip was overwhelming. But it wasn't until the second and third trip that we started seeing where we fit in the grand scheme of things. And a lot of that comes from delegate support as well. Because as they were winning deals, they saw opportunities where they said, well, our client's been interested in this. Another one of our delegates should be brought in. And that's been a valuable part. Rather than coming on our own, coming with delegations has opened doors as a, just in a referral sense. There's a lot of trade missions about. Mm. What was the process for you to choose the right one to come here to Qingdao? Part of our exploration process was we attended all of them. 
We went on a local government one with Adelaide City Council. We've attended quite a few, state government and also federal. So part of that experience resulted in us finding out where we fit best. And so I would recommend for anyone who's looking to experience a trade mission and wouldn't know where to start, if just to focus a little bit on their product service and whether they are a national company. So because of the reach that you'd have as a national organisation in Australia, a federal mission might be a better fit because you'd get those introductions that work for each state. For us, being focused on minimal states, a state mission tends to work better. Do you think the Shandong South Australia bilateral relationship, 30 years old, has helped you? Absolutely. We would not have been able to open any of these doors without their support, without having people like our Premier and our Lord Mayor by our side. The relationship building here on business to business level would have been significantly slower without them. And we are able to go from a business to business level to a business to government level, which is fantastic. Today's MOU, which we are very excited, we finally signed an MOU. Congratulations. Thank you. Was with uh, one of the largest health check organisations in all of China. So they have 300 hospitals. For us, that's mind blowing. We're looking to bring their patients into Adelaide and Sydney and Melbourne. But these, the scale here is, is huge. In China, many people sign MOUs. MOUs all over the place, does it lead to actual real business? It does, and that's a mindset shift for an Australian because initially when we came over and they said, we want to do cooperation, I'm like, fantastic, that means we sign a contract, right? No, we sign a memorandum of understanding. And for us in business, we're going, so are we doing business yet or is this just a friendliness document? We weren't sure where it sat. But the more that we explored the market, the more trade missions we did, we saw that if they were willing to sign an MOU, they're willing to do business. It's not just a friendly agreement, you're a nice person kind of document. So that has led to business for us, absolutely. Opportunities in agribusiness, food and wine, are emerging in second tier cities throughout China. As rising incomes and food safety concerns boost demand for imported clean and green produce. South Australian exporter CMV Farms produces the Shiraz Hill wine label specifically for the Chinese market. And it deliberately targeted second and third tier cities first, not the big four. I visited its Langhorn Creek vineyard to find out more. The Chinese market is, uh, compared to the, the Western uh, market, is just quite unique in, in their preferences, uh, not only in the wine styles, but also in, in the type of labelling and the branding uh, that goes with it. Wine is pretty new to China culturally. How did you tailor your product for the Chinese market? We found um, through our partner who are our importers in China um, the different taste profiles that they like uh, and we created three product tiers based on, on their advice. Um, so we've got an entry level product which is a bit lighter bodied uh, as well as um, a premium product which comes off this property uh, and is much more robust in style and we find that uh, across China those styles really work uh, very well with the Chinese um, customer uh, as well as then with the labelling that goes with it um, to support the, the wine inside. Are there things that work quite well in a Western market that perhaps don't work so well in China? Yeah definitely we've, we've learnt the hard way a few times with things that we think are quite logical uh, in our market that resonate in Australia but just don't make any sense to the Chinese consumer and, and that's really just about understanding their language and, and their base. Um, I took a, a very brief introductory course in Mandarin just to really, not that I'll ever be fluent in it, I wish I could be, but uh, just to really learn the basis of their language and, and how that then resonates in the wine world as well when, with wine descriptors that, you know, they've never tasted uh, what a raspberry is or a blackberry is. They've got very unique other flavours that resonate better with them in their market. You developed Shearer's Hill for second and third tier cities. Now why is this? Tier one cities would be great but they're very competitive. It's a, a very different market space that's already been developed and you know, being Shearer's, Shearer's Hill being a new brand we thought why not why not focus our attention on some of these smaller cities that have been a little bit more forgotten by some of the bigger brands and, and let's see if we can be successful there because that's still selling a lot of wine in those markets uh, when you're successful. Everyone's in Shanghai and you go uh, yeah. to Qingdao and Jinan, these cities there, 
you know, they're, they're 10 million people. Yes. So they're not small country towns, are they? No, no, exactly. The global wine market is a very competitive space, um, not only for even just South Australian brands. We're now competing with, you know, Chile and Argentina, and we've got to find our place in, in the market. And I really believe we've got a strong chance in those um, second and third tier cities to really grow with their population as they develop as well. China can be a challenging market for first time exporters. Cultural language barriers make it even harder if you choose to start with second tier cities. Local partners and customers may have limited experience in dealing with foreigners. English is not widely spoken and you will probably need a translator for business meetings. To do well, you must understand and respect the local business culture and government processes. This can change between provinces. What is accepted here in Shandong province may not work over in Sichuan. When travelling around town alone, make sure you have your destination written in Chinese and the card of your hotel to ensure your safe return. Allow adequate time for travel and delays, whether it's domestic flight connections or local taxi trips. Let's visit the Hyatt Regency Qingdao to learn more about how business dealings and entertainment is unique in this part of China. The transactional business will take place, but I think before that there's quite a big part on, on getting to know each other. And, and building the relationship. So there's a big run-up with getting Correct. to know each other, but when Correct. it happens, it happens. Correct. And you want to make sure that when you plan your business trip, you plan this, because you don't expect to just come for the meeting. There's usually going to be a lot of time to get to know each other before that. Rel building relationship in China is very important. Being in a secondary city, we're still in a more, little bit more traditional environment, so it's, it's, it's even more important. If I was to be dining with a uh, a Qingdao business person to, to meet each other, build our relationship. How would it work? Would, uh, would the host serve me with the, with the chopsticks, with the quasda, or would you just dig in together? You don't want to start going into the dishes before you host those. I you think it's, it's quite polite, correct. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it's quite common that your host may try to serve you. And when talking, is it a matter of the, the head person talking to the head person and inviting the others to join in. During dinner, you will probably have a lot of toast, which are, which are um, handled by the, the, the host, especially in private environment. It's quite common that, you know, two third, from two thirds of the meal, people usually stand up and, and will start to kind of have private, private gathering while the meal continue. Um, and that's, that's really a good opportunity to build long-term relationship. So when they're not talking business, what would a typical person in a second tier city talk about? I think people are quite interested to know about you and that's very important. Um, you've got to be prepared maybe to be asked some, some personal question, talking about your family, talking about your country, your culture. I think these are a great way to connect with people um, and, and that way you're allowed to build a very meaningful relationship and, and that will be very important when you come to the business um, Conversation. Well, that's it from Qingdao. I hope you've learned a lot from this special episode of the Airport Economist and we'll look north, west and south in future, as well as to the bright lights of Shanghai. Let's recap what we've learned from our time in a second tier city. English is not spoken here like it is in Beijing or Shanghai, so you'll need translation. Second tier cities are alternative markets in their own right, not just a stepping stone to the big four cities. The government badge still matters, so discover your home state sister provincial relationship like Shandong and South Australia and get to know people in the local administration. Take advantage of major events, government trade missions, industry trade shows and festivals. They will help you meet the key decision makers. Learn a few local customs and some history before you go. It will go a long way with local partners. Head over to our website, theairporteconomist.com, where you can watch extended guest interviews, discover exclusive offers from our partners, and find out where we're flying to next. See you next time. I'm Tim Harcourt, and I'm The Airport Economist.